Sup Chooms, how y'all living? Hope everything is Nova, and if you are an American or a Canadian, I hope you all had a glorious Thanksgiving. So sometimes, my viewers will ask me to do a video on a specific topic that I haven't covered before. I actually have a file on my computer where I keep track of all these numerous requests, and believe it or not, that file contains several hundred potential topics. So, I have a lot of topics on the back burner right now, but what often happens to me is that if there's some breaking hair loss news, or some new cutting edge treatment that's on the pipeline, or there's some new stuff on finasteride, dutasteride, or minoxidil, what I'll do is that I will always prioritize those subjects on this channel first, since they are obviously the most important subjects. However, I do have a very large backlog of other topics I'd like to cover very soon, so I'm going to try to go over some of them this month, but of course, if there's any hair loss treatment breaking news that I hear about until then, I'll still prioritize that, so we'll just have to wait and see. So anyone who has taken even a cursory look at the numerous hair loss treatments on the internet will find out very quickly that there are a lot of fringe treatments for hair hair loss, and most of them are completely bogus, like scalp massages or any other product or program that promises to regrow hair by promoting better bleach flow to the scalp. But it is possible that some of these products might help just a little bit, even though I don't have very much research behind them at the moment. So what happened recently is that one of my loyal viewers asked me recently about capsaicin as a treatment for hair loss. Now, most of you probably already know that capsaicin is the ingredient in hot peppers that makes them very hot. I personally love trying out different kinds of hot peppers and hot pepper sauces. In fact, one thing I used to do back when I was a young man is when I played multiplayer games like Unreal Tournament 2004, I would eat a raw jalapeno pepper or nurse on a bottle of Tabasco sauce because I felt that the heat would increase my focus and thus improve my performance in the game. I haven't done that in a good while now, but recently I have gotten into playing Helldivers 2 on the PlayStation 5, so maybe I'll give it another shot soon. I just hope it doesn't give me an ulcer or something like that, but I really never thought about what effect capsaicin might have on my hair in any of that time. Of course, if you follow my channel, you guys probably already know that I'm very skeptical of natural treatments in general. Androgenic alopecia, after all, is a natural physiological process that is linked to our genes. So when it comes to hair loss, nature is the enemy. As it turns out though, capsaicin is also a very strong antioxidant and anti-inflammatory agent and has been shown to have anti-obesity and many other health benefits as well. So it's not surprising that there actually has been some research on the effects of capsaicin on hair growth, though it hasn't been as well researched as it probably should be. The first study is from Japan, and it was an article published in 2007. The title of the article is, quote, Administration of capsaicin and isoflavone promotes hair growth by increasing insulin-like growth factor production in and in humans with alopecia." Unquote. As you can tell from the title, this study primarily looked at the effects of capsaicin along with another phytochemical called isoflavone on insulin-like growth factor 1, also known as IGF-1. IGF-1 is a hormone, and we know that it is important for hair growth because people born with an IGF-1 deficiency called Laron syndrome, they end up having decreased hair growth. Not only that, people with androgenic alopecia have decreased levels of IGF-1 in the hair follicles in areas of the balding scalp. That means that IGF-1 is one of the many hormones that is down-regulated as a downstream effect of the trash hormone DHT. So anything that increases IGF-1 levels in a balding scalp could improve hair growth in people with androgenic alopecia or even other kinds of hair loss, at least theoretically. However, there are also negatives to increasing IGF-1 levels, but I'll get back to that in a bit later. So getting back to the article on capsaicin, the first part of the study was a mouse study. The investigators used both normal mice and mice lacking a gene for a protein called CGRP, which is a protein that is activated by capsaicin. So, first of all, the investigators injected 1 milligram per kilogram of capsaicin under the skin of mice and then did skin biopsies to look at the effects on IGF-1 levels. As you can see in this figure here, capsaicin did in fact increase IGF-1 levels in levels of IGF-1 messenger RNA in the normal wild-type mice shown on the left. In the mice who lacked the CGRP protein necessary for capsaicin to have an effect, there was no change in IGF-1 levels. That's what's shown here on the right-hand side of the graph. When capsaicin was combined with isoflavone, there was even more of an effect on skin IGF-1 levels, including effects on the sebaceous glands and the dermal papilla, which is part of the hair follicles as you can see here. The investigators then looked at hair regrowth in mice after four weeks of 0.1 milligram per kilogram per day of capsaicin plus or minus isoflavone. 
As you can see in this figure, there was better regrowth in panel B, which was the capsaicin group, and in panel C, which was the combined capsaicin plus isoflavin group, than there was in panel A, which was the control group that received no treatment. Now, I know what you're all thinking right now, but Kevin, this is just a mouse study. You can practically piss on a mouse and it will still regrow hair. This data is useless, bro. Well, fortunately, this isn't just a mouse study. The investigators also recruited 48 human subjects with alopecia for the second part of the study. There were 25 men and 23 women, and 34 of these subjects had androgenic alopecia. The rest had other forms of alopecia, like alopecia totalis and alopecia areata. These subjects were given capsaicin capsules at a dose of 6 milligrams per day, along with isoflavone at a dose of 75 milligrams per day. After five months of treatment, blood levels of IGF-1 were increased compared to baseline. So so capsaicin along with isoflavone increased IGF-1 levels in humans as well as in mice. In addition, hair regrowth was judged by the investigators based on before and after photographs. The investigators didn't know which subjects were getting active treatment versus ones which were just getting a placebo treatment. It turns out that hair growth was judged to be better in the treatment group versus the placebo control group. 64% of subjects on treatment were judged to have improved hair growth on capsaicin and isoflavone versus just 11.8% on placebo. This figure shows some examples of the effects on hair growth. The article concludes by saying, quote, Taken together, observations in the present study raise the possibility that combined administration of capsaicin and isoflavone increases IGF-1 production in hair follicles through activation of sensory neurons, thereby promoting hair growth in humans suffering from alopecia. These possibilities should be examined further in a large controlled study of human subjects with androgenic alopecia in the future, unquote. So that article was written back in 2007, which is the year the first Mass Effect came out. Unfortunately, no one has followed the advice to do a large controlled study of humans with androgenic alopecia. What we do have, though, are two studies of subjects with a different condition, specifically alopecia areata. Alopecia areata is a condition that is related to the immune system attacking the hair follicles. It's not related to androgenic alopecia. But anyways, the first study is this one here from 2009. 50 subjects with alopecia areata were randomized to get either topical capsaicin cream or to get a steroid cream called clobetamine which is a standard treatment for alopecia areata. The subjects were treated for 12 weeks, and the results showed new growth of vellus hairs, which are small, almost invisible hairs with capsaicin, but no increase in cosmetically visible hair. So, even though the growth was just the formation of new vellus hairs, the investigators still felt that capsaicin might be beneficial in alopecia areata. They concluded by saying, quote, Our data suggests that capsaicin may even be more effective than conventional and commonly used drugs like clobetasol. I don't think those results were really all that impressive, but it was a short duration study, and it's possible that with longer follow-up studies that there would have been more growth of terminal hairs, which are normal looking hairs that usually have some color in them. But fortunately, we do have one more capsaicin hair growth study to look at here, Chums, and it's this one right here from China, and it was published in 2022. The subjects in the study were once again people with alopecia areata. 60 subjects were randomized to get a topical mixture of 0.03% capsaicin, 0.1% curcumin, and 0.1% piperine twice a day, or they got 5% topical minoxidil once daily. The subjects were treated for 12 weeks and were evaluated by a special point score used for alopecia areata called a SALT score and by a dermoscope to count hairs. The results of the study showed improvement in both the capsaicin group and the minoxidil group based on changes in their SALT scores and by dermoscopy. There were no real differences in the efficacy between the two groups, meaning capsaicin and minoxidil were equally effective based on the study. Here are some images showing some of the improvements in hair growth on the capsaicin mixture. As you might have expected, the subjects often experienced a burning sensation from the capsaicin mixture, but it was mild and temporary. So, the investigators concluded from all this that the mixture of capsaicin, piperate, and curcumin was effective in treating alopecia areata, but but it was not superior to topical 5% minoxidil. Of course, this data is just on alopecia areata, which is completely different from androgenic alopecia. Also, it's not even pure capsaicin we're talking about here, Chooms, in the last study. Instead, it was a mixture of capsaicin with piperine and curcumin. So, what can we conclude from all this research? Well, first of all, there isn't much research on capsaicin for hair loss, so we can't really draw any strong conclusions here. Secondly, we don't have much research on using capsaicin specifically for androgenic alopecia. Most of the research just looked at the subjects who had alopecia 
alopecia areata, which is an inflammatory disease where an anti-inflammatory substance like capsaicin might be more useful than it would be for androgenic alopecia, which is not an inflammatory condition. And even in the subject with alopecia areata, capsaicin wasn't more effective than a treatment we already have, specifically minoxidil. Still, it is possible that capsaicin might have some general growth stimulating effects. So if you love eating hot peppers, maybe you're getting some slight benefit. And I'm saying that with a very, very strong maybe here, Chums. However, the one study that did include subjects with antritic alopecia were given capsules containing six milligrams of capsaicin per day, along with 75 milligrams of isoflavone per day. You'd have to eat a pretty damn powerful pepper to get six milligrams of capsaicin per day. The pepper with the highest capsaicin concentration is the Carolina Reaper, and it contains 100 milligrams per gram, including eating the seeds. A whole Carolina Reaper pepper weighs about one gram. Most people, though, can only tolerate a very tiny amount of a Carolina Reaper, but theoretically, if you ate one per day, you'd be getting a huge dose of 100 milligrams of capsaicin per day. As someone who has actually tried a Carolina Reaper pepper before, I can promise you that even just eating one of them will make you feel like you are pissing fire and lava. Jalapeno peppers, on the other hand, weigh more, usually from 15 to 25 grams, but they have far less capsaicin with a concentration of only 0.03 milligrams per gram. So you'd have to eat about 10 of them per day to get the 6 milligram per day dose used in the first study that I quoted. But if you prefer just to take a supplement, then you will be relieved to know that there are indeed capsaicin supplements and creams available that you can find at your local Whole Foods grocery store right next to the book section about coconut oil miracles and bone broth cleansing. But honestly, I don't think it's worth it based on the current evidence. There is simply just not enough evidence to recommend that you start eating hot peppers or take capsaicin supplements or that you smear some obscure capsaicin ointment all over your scalp if you aren't already a fan of hot peppers to begin with. In fact, this kind of reminds me of something I remember way back in the day about another hair loss YouTuber named 80K Pinecone. 80K Pinecone tried to save his hair by using a combination of capsaicin and some other natural treatments like castor oil and saw palmetto and, well, this is what he looks like today. So I guess it didn't work. So one of the reasons why capsaicin may not actually work in real life is that even though increasing IGF-1 levels causes hair growth in specific people who have low IGF-1 levels, such as people who have Larin syndrome, there is also evidence that too much IGF-1 may actually be harmful to your hair. That's because a high level of IGF-1 increases the sensitivity of the androgen receptor to DHT and may also stimulate the 5-air enzyme that produces DHT. However, like I already showed you, peppers don't really have that much capsaicin in them to have much of an effect one way or the other. Also, like the first study lamented, we still don't have a good randomized controlled study showing that capsaicin is beneficial in people with antritic alopecia specifically. Remember, alopecia areata is completely unrelated to antritic alopecia, so any data about that condition and capsaicin isn't really all that relevant. So, in conclusion, I think if you are a fan of hot peppers, then maybe you can get a little satisfaction out of the possibility that maybe just maybe you are stimulating some hair growth. I mean, I don't want to completely close the door to this possibility that it might help just on the off chance that it may upregulate some metabolic pathways that maybe don't even have anything to do with IGF-1 at all and could cause hair growth in their own unique mechanism. I mean, in that case, even I could benefit from capsaicin since I absolutely do enjoy spicy foods very frequently. But even taking the most optimistic interpretation of capsaicin's effects on hair growth, hot peppers are definitely no substitute for what is already been proven to work clinically to prevent hair loss. Of course, I'm talking about finasteride, dutasteride, and topical minoxidil. So anyways, I just wanted to do a short video on this subject, but I'll make sure to cover all the topics you hair loss witchers have been clamoring for very soon. But until then, take care, chooms, stay warm, and go kill some automatron and terminated scum in the name of freedom and managed democracy. God bless Super Earth. See you all next time.